to the Jean SEO Hangouts on Air. This week we have an all Aussie Hangout. Um, very excited to introduce uh, a few of my fellow agency um, professionals and um, SEOs. And the topic for today is scaling up your agency while maintaining quality of work and service. So left to right we've got uh, Andrew from Reprise Media, um, we've got David Ivanov, um, George has just joined us, uh, we've got James, uh, James Norqui, and um, Kevin has just joined us. Kevin is probably the only non-Aussie in this hangout, which is a rare occurrence. Um, welcome Kevin and uh, Mark Lindsay. So um, officially on the um, event we've uh, featured uh, Mark uh, from Mercurian Media and um, Andrew from Reprise as the featured companies uh, in a discussion, but I welcome everyone else who has joined the Hangout to contribute with their thoughts and, um, and ideas. So what, what I'd like to do is um, start, uh, start this uh, Hangout, give it a good kickoff with um, a little bit of a story. So I'll just uh, tell you how things uh, happened uh, on my end here. Um, I was an SEO for a long time and at some point uh, I decided that uh, I should stop working for other firms and then I wanted to try out doing things solo. So um, for a brief period of time um, I was a one-man company, had uh, some pretty big uh, clients lined up very quickly and I decided that I needed to uh, get out of my home office and, and uh, escape uh, the daily uh, interruptions and uh, I started hiring. One thing led to another and I ended up with uh, what 40 plus staff. Um, the challenges that I'm facing um, as part of the growth that I, that I had um, gone through in the past and still experiencing has always been how do I remain, the, the, how do I retain the same quality of work that I used to do when I was a freelancer, when I was a one-man uh, army to what happens now when we have so many people, so many variables at play. Um, in today's Hangout we've got people from different types of setup which is great, um, hopefully it gives people a lot of inspiration, a lot of uh, ideas and perhaps people can identify. So uh, what I'll do is I'll hand over to um, Andrew who can introduce themselves, his team and the company and just give um, our viewers uh, a brief uh, introduction as to um, what the setup is and uh, what type of uh, challenges they're currently going through. So um, over to you, Andrew. Um, thanks very much. Uh, I'm here with uh, Wayne Davis, who's one of our search specialists uh, within the SEO team uh, here at Reprise in Sydney. Um, Reprise uh, in Australia is uh, a three-year-old company. Um, uh, uh, as many of you may know, um, Reprise was a, a company born out of the US around about eight years ago. Um, we've grown from four people uh, to a team of 60 uh, in, in that three-year period um, and the business has uh, got four specific streams of work, uh, paid search, SEO, uh, social and analytics. Uh, we also have a, a client service team who, who work across all of those disciplines. So um, obviously you can imagine over, uh, over the three years that we've been running we've experienced a number of the growing pains that uh, uh, a lot of SEO and a lot of digital agencies experience, um, especially given that we're in the position where we're part of a larger media organization and a larger media group. So um, obviously we've gone through a, a, a huge phase of education um, and then adoption uh, and then actual uh, optimization of how we're approaching uh, the different agencies, the different clients within our group to ensure that we're not only offering value to, um, to our clients um, but also sharing knowledge and offering value internally so we're actually building loyalty to the SEO product as well as the wider search and reprise media brand. So we've gone through quite a, quite a considerable evolution and I'm sure we'll touch on a few more of those um, those challenges as we go further through the session. Fantastic. So, um, what, what you what you're saying is basically um, you a you're part of a, a, a larger entity, 
And uh, I would imagine in your setup, you will have a lot of benefits as part of that because there are already uh, rules and uh, procedures set up on an operational level that should make things uh, run a lot smoother. So I'm, I'm hoping to hear uh, a little bit more about uh, uh, that from you. I'm going to um, switch over to um, Mark, who can, who can uh, introduce his uh, uh, company and tell us a little bit about his uh, start, about his setup. Um, and where he's heading now with uh, Mercurium Media. Uh, over to you, Mark. Yeah, hi. Thanks, Dan, for, uh, for inviting me along to this. Really appreciate it. As you know, my name is Mark Lindsay from Mercurium Media. And I guess we started online probably around eight years ago. We didn't start uh, directly in servicing the market uh, from an SEO perspective, though we've always been in SEO. Uh, we started as uh, doing it for ourselves, if you will, uh, in the direct response, direct copy industry. So we have heavy experience in that. We just noticed that uh, we put a lot of strength into setting up highly capable offshore teams. Uh, I won't call it outsourcing because outsourcing is indicative that you uh, are running through another company um, or out tasking. I call it insourcing, where you set up teams around highly, highly proficient people or A players, if you will, that are just an extension of your team. And in doing that, we realised uh, there were a few a few gaps in the market where we thought we could we could fill quite easily um, in the Australian space anyway. Also heavily into e-commerce ourselves, and our agency is both a catalyst for companies uh, as a B two B service, and also for our own companies in e-commerce. Uh, I figure that if we are good enough to do it for others, and this is just our strategy uh, in particular. Then, uh, then we should be doing it ourselves because the leverage ability of doing it yourself also. Uh, you know, can uh, can really give you a difference, as you would know as well. Uh, when you're good at what you do, um, you can do it for yourself, obviously, at far different rates than you would as a commercial aspect. Challenges that we've had, uh, as you know, we've gone through a rebrand. I guess you could say I used to be a purist SEO. Uh, in, and when I say purist, I don't mean in the sense of white hat or black hat. I mean in the sense of uh, uh, chanting that SEO is the only way. Quote, unquote, free traffic, which doesn't exist. Uh, from then, I'd say probably over the last year um, and further, more when we got into our e-commerce, we've extended out quite broad in our thoughts. And I mean, we've always been good at, uh, at what we do from a, from a AdWords or from a search, uh, from traditional search marketing in the paid industry, but we never considered it part of our service. So Mercurian was born of the fact that we didn't feel anymore we were being congruent with what we believed in. And uh, so we decided to completely change what our, our position was in the market uh, and quite effectively, which now comes under the three terms of traffic strategy and, uh, and conversion, which kind of sums up online quite well for us. Challenges we've had, we've got a team of uh, just over 40 and when you work with, when you work with teams offshore, the main, main challenge is not actually the fact that you have a time difference that we've noticed, it's the fact that it allows you to scale out quicker than a company might normally be able to scale out if they were working within Australia or if they were a larger corporate. There's already predetermined expectation that you have a stable, a very stable income of between sort of five million plus if you're looking at that kind of employee range. Whereas when you're working uh, outside of Australia, you can scale that quite quickly, but you may not actually have the infrastructure or system set up to be able to handle what uh, the output and result is from that. So that's been an interesting learning curve from there. Uh, and and still continues to be today. Uh, the largest aspect of that is quite simply setting up systems, um, or as I like to say, uh, trust, delegate, and verify. It's a little bit about us. Um, and look, I hope that I can bring some value to this conversation for everybody. Excellent. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much for that, uh, Mark. Um, what I want to do is uh, perhaps uh, just uh, uh, touch on our other um, Hangout participants. Uh, uh, David, just. Uh, a sentence about who you are and the uh, um, agency where you work, if you don't mind. Yep, cool. Um, yeah, so I'm one of the SEO managers here at Razorfish in Melbourne. Um, and I guess I've got an experience working with outsourcers and freelancers um, because I used to run my own agency, Lost Agency, and I didn't really have the resources to employ staff to get things done. Um, and I even wrote a blog post about you know, outsourcing is not for big multinationals anymore. Um, so, you know, very much believe that, you know, it's a smart way um, to kind of scale up your agency or even your projects if you've got a deadline to meet. 
Okay, thanks, David. Um, let's hear from uh, James. Tell us a little bit about your setup uh, over there. Introduce your company. Uh, hi, uh, my name is James Norquay. Um, we work in uh, Aegis Media, Asia Pacific. So we work with company. We've got Columbus Search, which is the company I work under. I started the SEO division here. We have, uh, I think it's like almost 10 people in Sydney now. We've got people in Melbourne, Brisbane. Primarily, we do a lot of uh, paid search. I think we have like 40 paid search people in Sydney and like 30 in Melbourne. So pretty big from paid search point of view. And in terms of uh, scaling the business, yeah, definitely. Uh, I think everyone has those issues, but we do it for more enterprise level clients. So I think working with clients on a daily basis might be a bit different in dealing with some of the smaller businesses. But yeah, there's always going to be niggling issues with uh, different aspects of the job. And I guess we'll talk more about that as the hangout proceeds. And John's also here with me today as well. Hey. Hi, Phil. Um, just wanted to introduce you. Um, I had my microphone mute, so you couldn't hear me. <laughs> um, so tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, and the company. Uh, just make sure you don't do the same mistake of leaving your microphone mute. And here we are. Uh, when you join in, it's mute by default. That's how it works. And now can everybody hear me? Yes, we can. Go <laughs> ahead. <laughs> Awesome. I think this is uh, my first uh, full-on uh, hangout, so I'm still adjusting these things. Okay, cool. Hi, everybody. Um, thanks very much for inviting me, um, Dan. Um, so I'm from uh, Clever Clicks. We're primarily um, PPC and also a bit of focus on Google Analytics. Our target market is SMEs. Started the business about five or six years ago um, and started outsourcing, or, well, offshoring. Um, but there was always a a short-term strategy to get started, not knowing what we were doing. It was good uh, working with work with some really good people, um, but now everything we do, our staff are in Australia. Um, so we've got um, three and a half people, depending how you sort of count them. Um, and uh, yeah, we're quite interested in this topic. It's something now we're starting to scale. So looking at marketing automation, um, software, and that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, quite very interested in this topic. It's a uh, you know, this year is about scaling for us. Thanks very much. Um, so, one one thing that's kind of popped up in uh, conversations so far was um, um, outsourcing, and um, it, it seems like that was uh, whether you have uh, jobs outsourced or whether you have teams built by yourself uh, overseas seems to be a way of um, scaling up and staying staying profitable. So. Like to hear about that a little bit, um, um, a little bit later as well. Um, now I know that Kevin um, had some really interesting questions uh, for the panel, so um, I'd like to give him the opportunity to ask the first uh, um, question. So um, I know he had about three, so pick one that's really uh, sort of uh, most interesting to you, and um, let's see if the hangout participants can um, answer that for you. Uh. Thanks, I, I appreciate it. Um, my name is Kevin Getch, uh, president of Web4, and I'm in a similar situation where I founded the company about three and a half years ago, and uh, in the last year we've hired about seven people, uh, grown by 150%, and now we're looking to hire a uh, someone to basically do my position because we're, we're growing that much. And um, really, when I look at a couple of the questions that I, I had um, that I'm always looking at is what you know what are the key things that you measure because whatever you measure you know obviously those are the things that people are going to excel in uh, making sure that you measure those things so what KPIs do you measure your team on specifically from uh, an SEO standpoint that's our main focus though we do uh, PPC and analytics and social a few other things as well but our core focus is SEO so looking for what you know key things that uh, your agency is measuring from your employees Okay, very good question. Um, 
Is anyone uh, keen to answer that one first, or I'll just pick at random? Yeah, sure. I'll, uh, this is something that, that we're going through right now. Actually, I've been through many iterations uh, of how we measure and track, and especially when you have fairly substantial offshore uh, offshore teams as well, it becomes it becomes quite important. We used to measure everything via what you what you would deem a typical KPI scenario. Um, however, if you get the wrong measurement there, then you know, obviously you're going to force the, the wrong activity. A typical example would be if someone was in a call center and you were measuring you know, call output, then uh, quality might suffer because that will drive towards uh, drive towards a call volume rather than a quality. Just something personally that we're looking a lot into at the moment is um, probably heard of him, but uh, Edward Deming and his philosophies on systems and building about things, and that is that uh, by hiring hiring the right people and creating the right system behind it, and that doesn't mean uh, catering for every single potential. You don't create a system for, for lack of a better word, for uh, for stupid people. I can say that. Uh, not that people are stupid entirely, but they, if people don't follow a system, it's there for that. But we just say we don't want to cater for the minority and create a system around the people on your team that are highly intelligent and capable, which hopefully is, uh, we don't try to hire everybody like that, but it doesn't always work out. And by taking up to the systems level, it means we can evaluate it uh, at every point. And, and uh, something that, that he talks about is that every single employee contributed 35 suggestions a year on improving their systems, which is phenomenal. I don't think I've, I, I know we don't get anywhere near that, but if I know that if we can, it'll make a huge impact on, on what we're doing as so long as you go and actually implement them. So from there, I guess we're looking at it as a result from the client perspective and looking at it and breaking it down into business metrics. Um, something that I came to more of an understanding of recently and, and in everything that I do with when I talk to someone, when I talk to a client, I don't talk to them about SEO, I don't talk to them about SDM, I don't talk to them about any specific activity, I talk to them about a business objective and about an objective they want to achieve with their current uh, their current marketing profile or their current spend ability. And I find that once you do that, the rest of it, dare I say, doesn't matter. Um, of course, you have to, and, and the natural assumption is that you're good at what you do, otherwise you wouldn't be talking to them. So the systems are simply there to help measure uh, their output, and you can break down from there. If they have an ROI, and then you can break it down into the type of, whether it be the type of activity or the type of link quality they require. Um, from that point, then the measurement is, is clear, and it's about people's ability to follow the system. That's yep. how we're looking at it at the moment. I don't know if it is the right or wrong way yet. Um, I guess we'll find out. Oh, I don't think there's uh, there's a right or wrong. Is uh, but there's I, I guess there's different the two types of KPIs that we're talking about. There are there are KPIs and expectations from the client's end. You know, uh, some people may come to you with pre -con preconceived ideas about what SEO KPIs should be, because this this uh, as I understand. Kevin's interested in SEO side of things, so uh, from client they might go ask you know how many links are going to build each month, what page rank are they going to be, what's the what's the increase of one one phrase um, from from month to month, um, how is that how is that going, um, and I think uh, and I think a lot of uh, a lot of people that we talk to uh, get hooked up on those on those type of metrics and. Uh, from my experience, and, and the, the KPIs that we're trying to push here is uh, more around the traffic increase uh, keyword agnostic, so uh, across uh, across the whole level. Um, looking at uh, one thing that upsets me personally is uh, when somebody says, "Okay, um, you can pick three keywords, or five keywords, or ten keywords. How can you possibly predict how many like?" The, how many keywords people will type in? People are very good at inventing new ways of finding you on on Google. Um, so, uh, using using a, a little bit more um, relaxed way of looking at uh, um, keywords that you're targeting and embed them in, in content seems like a lot more, more logical um, idea. And not get hooked up on link quantities, um, but look at um, the value and the logic behind uh, behind links generated. And of course. Uh, at the end of the day, why we're doing this is uh, uh, traffic and conversions. I think that's what what everyone's KPI is and and it should be. But um, let's hear a little bit from um, Andrew. Let's see if um, Reprise have said anything in particular in terms of 
internal KPIs, I, I guess, from their own staff and, and you know, performance of, of people working on campaigns and also what are the type of KPIs that they establish um, for, uh, for their clients. Um, yeah, look, absolutely. The, I think starting with, with the client is obviously one thing that we always focus on. You know, what, what, it, what is the client trying to achieve? What is the overall media objective? And those, those uh, kind of expectations and um, outcomes are normally uh, something that comes down from a wider or a broader media brief. And I'm sure that um, that anybody who's working in agency environment is going to experience something similar. Um, the uh, the actual execution of, of the campaign um, and then the measurement of your achievement against uh, the client's expectations is is also uh, kind of one of the one of the factors that we consider. So obviously, best campaign to achieve the best outcomes. Um, it is is one of the simple ways that um, that we can measure success. However, those the challenges that are associated with that could um, could be down to ownership of website. Is it is it from a client? Uh, it, are those challenges coming from a client perspective? How do we uh, better improve communication? And it was one of the points that was touched on earlier. You know, the campaign management um, of uh, of any. A particular uh, activity that we're doing um, is 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 very very important. You know, communication with um, not just internally but also with external client teams are are, are things that we measure. Um, ultimately, the 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 client is going to look at um, results and uh, any success metrics that we uh, that we create at the start of the campaign are. Um, what we uh, what we campaign uh, report at the end of uh, at the end of any activity that we uh, that we conduct. So uh, satisfaction is quite transparent. We have an objective. Did we meet that objective? Did we exceed that objective? Um, and if we did achieve that objective, what were what were the contributing factors to that? If we didn't achieve the objective, then how how can we um, how can we learn um, and distribute that learning back to the client to say um, these are the these are the factors these are the considerations that resulted in us not achieving uh, our goal um, and you know revising policy and process and procedures that uh, that sit around that um, I think going back to the, the the core question which is what what do we measure from an SEO perspective. Um, I think that um, there's, uh, to an extent, the the client's uh, perceived value. Um, I think what what would the equivalent cost have been um, from a paid search perspective or from a display perspective to get those or that volume of traffic from other sources is also an interesting um, uh, factor that we consider. Um, when we're measuring success, um, not just of the individuals who are running campaigns, but also from a wider campaign um, or a client perspective. Fantastic. Thanks. Uh, thanks for your insights, um, Andrew. Um, I, I know that um, uh, David uh, is pretty big on, on analytics, and um, his KPIs may be. Uh, Probably goal oriented. I'd like to hear what he has to say about what what uh, KPIs is uh, uh, chasing internally. Um, yeah. So I, I guess our big thing is, um, you know, while it's as much traffic as possible, it's obviously there's much, um, you know, conversions or, um, you know, inquiries. So that it, you know, there's obviously two metrics to it. Um, typically, like when we've got, I can't really talk about work KPIs. Um, but in terms of you know when I'm dealing with outsourcers and freelancers, the types of KPIs I typically look at um, you know how many times I have to recheck or potentially how many times it's been maybe screwed up. Um, so I think the actual quality is probably a very strong KPI you need to be looking around. So you know when you talk about number of links built, you know what are the number of links built which you're you're proud of to show the client. You know what are the number of links which they've built you don't actually have to remove. Um, 
obviously we don't outsource any of our link building, um, but I think these are the types of metrics that you know you should be measuring. Um, and also, you know, when when you do build those links, if you use an agency um, or an outsourcer, how much traffic that actually sends through. Um, so I think that's good KPI, which you obviously measure within analytics. So you can say to the client, well, you know, you know, this link we built, you know, took two weeks of negotiation. Um, you know, we feel it has a positive impact because this page it's linking to is now, you know, getting more search impressions in Google Webmaster Tools. Um, but also we're actually able to track that it sent 300 referral visitors and made three quotes. So I, I think those types of KPIs, you know, did they do a good job? Did, how many times you had to recheck? Um, but also, you know, how much business, you know, that particular, um, you know, piece of content or link um, or social mention actually, you know, delivered for your client. I think that's what KPIs I'll be looking at. Yeah, yeah. Um, James, uh, no. have we missed anything that uh, that's that's so, done internally uh, within your you team. To, you, Dan? Uh, can you guys hear me? Sorry, there's a lot of background noise here. <laughs> yeah, what I was saying is, uh, is there anything that we haven't uh, mentioned in terms of KPIs? Um, most things are, yeah, the top level things have been mentioned. I mean, quality of content, if you're going to outsource something, you really just want to check the, uh, the quality that's coming through. I mean, as David said, maybe number of links is probably not a good metric to measure if you're going to be outsourcing stuff because, to be honest, I'd rather have 10 high quality links than 100 low quality links. So I think it's more about the quality of the work that you're receiving. Yeah. Um yeah. Um, Kevin, is this the Kevin, type this of answer that you were looking for? I, I feel like we've almost missed the target a little bit. Uh, let us know. Uh, all the information is, is very relevant and good. I guess my specific question was more around employees rather than like the client KPIs. Like we're, We have a really good grasp on that. It's more our internal employees. Like I, I posted in chat some of the things that we're looking at as far as percent of links assigned, like if we are pulling up links and assigning it or they're pulling up these opportunities and looking for whether it be a guest blog or a product review or whatever it may be, you know, and then them putting quality notes, like, so we do like a quarterly review and look, you know, are they putting notes in each opportunity, are they following up with each opportunity, um, you know, the percentages of links that they actually went after to the number that actually went active. Um, things like that. So those are the kind of things that we're measuring from that standpoint. So I'm trying to f expand on that or or refine that to be better, if that makes sense. So yeah. there's a couple of, a couple of things I'll add further onto that then. Um, and uh, I'd just like to say at, at, uh, at Andrew and whatnot there as well. I, I like uh, I like your methodology there. It sounds very similar in the fact that uh, driving by results, you don't. The activity is a requirement when something happens uh, and in reviewing. It's like sales. When sales are going fine, you don't need to look at the activity. Um, it's when something breaks or when you need to review it that you need to have all the backlog there and you can't track or look at something that you don't measure. Um, Kevin, to, to, answer you, to answer you on some of what we're doing at the moment, uh, if we're talking about outreach, I like to have daily reports to those that require them, be it the team lead. And those reports track, uh, we split test all of our emails that go out and our, and our communication via different, uh, via different approaches, whether it be personalized or whether it be, say, looking for problems on their site. And we'll have three or four that we're testing at any time. We'll also test the method used to find. Um, so we, these are variables, if you will, um, consider them attributes or, or variables in the person searching. Uh, we'll also have the way we find them, whether we're using particular search, uh, more general search terms or whether we're using um, more specific search terms in Google to find targets. On top of that, we'll then measure uh, the, the daily output of that person, currently measured by how many emails they're sending out per day, the date and time they sent the response, the time the first response comes back from the, uh, from the prospective partner for a link, uh, what the reply was like. If it's a negative reply, then uh, the template is always reviewed or we look at how it was done and someone will get in touch with them and ask why, um, like you know, to find out if we felt it was a good site and we had a good match, then that goes into a quality loop where we can actually find out if it was something we missed and getting in touch with them. Also, whether or not they required an editorial fee, um, which we're finding you know, probably about 40% are looking for an editorial fee over that. 
Uh, on top of that, we'll track that if they haven't replied, we'll also track a second email that goes out to them and they reply to that, as well as when we sent through an article, uh, when we started writing the article, so I know the gap difference between when we write to when we get it to the person, you don't have to wait. Um, we did trial initially having the articles ready to go before we sent them out, um, so we approached someone very personally with an article ready. I found that the uptake rate uh, of that, whilst higher per email sent, um, overall was lower, so we, we moved out of that quite quickly. Things we're split testing now is versus male versus female. Um, in the person, in the employee, uh, getting in touch with them as well. I have that on a daily basis sent uh, to the team, and then we measure ratios between some percentage of people that are contacted versus those that are accepted. Uh, and out of the ones that are accepted, uh, I then scale by country as well. So if we're working for Australia or for for a US client, uh, what are the accept acceptance rates in Australia versus the US versus uh, because you've got the attributes, you can then also do um, all sorts of nice stuff in, in finding out uh, whether it was particular attributes that are more specific to that country. That's when you need to find out if there's a problem or not. Uh, I then break it down into pre. Um, I, I'll, I'll refer to development in, in this stage because it, it suits me most. And it's a similar process. You have uh, any part of a good, good application or enterprise development involves development is actually the smallest part. Uh, the larger part is the planning of and the test acceptance or the test criteria that indicate that it was a successful result. So in this case, if we're talking about what we'll track, uh, the pre or the planning aspect is what is, my, what is the page that we're working on, what variations do they have in current anchor text coming in, so do they have a lot of uh, anchor text, are they in risk of, of crossing over a, a, a uh, the, the Google of uh, you're going to get hurt by, by some sort of penguin update or over optimization. And we'll track, we'll track the percentages of brand links as well versus um, straight URL links versus heavy anchor text links. That gives you the information to be able to adapt the, the keyword or the linking plan that you're about to employ. And then there's the development, or in this case, the actual link building, which is driven by the first aspect, which is what you know about them. And then there's the test acceptance, which is did it match the quality that we were looking for for that client that they were ha happy with and had a risk ratio that was acceptable? Because let's face it, every link that you're building has a risk ratio. It doesn't matter what you're building. Uh, and the second point from that is part of the feedback loop is that you're then researching back again what is being picked up and now what are your percentage differences in anchor text versus brand link versus domain links coming through. Right, and the final part, which is what result did it deliver for the client? Wow, um, Mark, I think you have a, a chance of uh, writing a successful successful book on uh, measuring uh, measuring team performance. The, the question is, when you when you learn this, it sounds like you get a lot of data out of this. Uh, I mean, this is amazing. But do you actually action on that data? What do you do? How do you um, communicate back to your team. Like for example, internally we have uh, we have a in comparison to yours we have a rather manual um, uh, uh, review. So we've got hierarchy and the team leaders look after the people under them and so forth. Um, and they may look at their tasks, they may look at the performance of the of the client in rankings and so forth. Um, we do have tools like in toolbars and, and database for you know links and content and that sort of stuff, but. None of that talks back to, to there's no performance module there. Um, now, I'm imagining if I do have one, which would be great to maintain quality for our clients, but how do you, like, have you had a, uh, an opportunity to speak to a staff member and, and work out the issues? And uh, can you share some experience and how that went? Uh, can you please ask this, the last question in, a, in another way? When you say talk to a staff member about the issues, yeah. Um, so you've you've learnt uh, a, a pr about a problem, about a problem about links or content or performance. The staff member is too slow or something went wrong. Um, do you actually have you had a chance uh, to act on the um, data that you received and spoken to a team member and uh, have you managed to successfully resolve the issue, whether they were too slow or they were building wrong type of links and so forth? Yes, yeah, so, so I, I'll bring this, I'll say that with that is a lot of data, you're right, and it's manual, there's no automated system for this at this point. We do have a few, I'll call them Excel geniuses on our team that uh, can do phenomenal work, so if you don't have development capability, hire someone that's extremely good at doing Excel 
and you'll save yourself a heck of a lot of time in the process. And they can do some amazing things. That's probably an immediate first step into automating a lot of that. Um, but to come back to your question, uh, it's still something that I feel we can do better, to be honest, Dan. Uh, what I do is I still hold an active, a very active interest in it because uh, I won't say that we've been doing this this methodology f forever. It's something I would consider newly implemented within the last four to six months to this depth anyway. And I guess if you can say uh, the quote unquote epiphany <laughs> that I had was exactly what I mentioned before, which is if, if we're not measuring it, measurement is not actually for the employee. We're not measuring their performance. We're measuring the performance of a system and there's a slightly different mindset or view on that, which is when you can take it away from the person, then you're measuring a system, and then you can look at, well, what is that person's skill set to be able to actively do what we need? And if they're under requirement, then train them. If they're over, if they're fine, then obviously they're doing it. So then you can say, well, are they following a system or not? If they're not, and they consistently don't, eject them from the team that don't belong. Because to me, uh, it, is a, it is a culture, a culture of consistent improvement, and, and that person should be able to follow it but also improve on it as well. So if we do see a problem in there, I'll go to them directly through with through and with one of my team leads. And the first question I ask is, what were you doing to be to, to end up with this result? So it's not why did you? Um, that doesn't mean attack on a person uh, and, and people will, will it promotes in my opinion a close down uh, or it can promote them to close down rather than to look at it and say, well you know, did they not understand it? In which case, then you can look at well, what? Why don't they understand it? Did we not explain it enough? Um, was there not? Uh, was there was there no introduction to that person in the activity? So I approach everything from a system, not from a person. Now, if you look at all that and you go, these guys are doing it. You obviously didn't follow the system, and you've let them know and explained why it's important, and it continues to happen. Then again, eject them from your team. You don't need them, or as I say, broaden their employment opportunities. Yep. <laughs> just, yep. just something uh, to to add to what's been said thus far. I, we, we have, uh, we do not outsource anything within um, within uh, Reprise. Um, we conduct all of our, our content creation within within our media group, and um, one of the things that we have uh, I've experienced historically is that when you put in place a, a lot of volume targets for people to achieve um, you know, relationships built or um, number, of, uh, number of times content is placed or, um, uh, and so on, you tend to see a, a automatically a drop in quality. And if, um, you know, as I say, drawing on previous experience where you have multiple people working towards, uh, towards uh, maybe a goal such as link uh, number of links or number of relationships built or placed, um, there tends to be a lack of sharing um, across individuals where individuals will tend to harbor um, their own relationships and harbor their own links. So, um, you know, as I say, within, within this environment, um, we, we have, um, you know, relationships that are built um, from a PR perspective, within our social team, which are equally shared within uh, within our within our, our, our SEO group, so it, it's just something that, in our experience, has has uh, led to a drop in quality historically. Okay, that's a um, really um, good point. Um, one one thing that I was thinking about, like in the last you know five ten minutes of discussion, is. Um, Kind of relating to Kevin, one of Kevin's other questions is, what uh, what actual tools, um, you know, management or CRM software do you guys use? Unless, of course, it's a secret or, a, or an in-house, but you can say that as well. Uh, for example, we here use uh, whatever's available and whatever works, and then when it doesn't exist, we build it. Um, obviously, building software is a um, an expensive exercise, and it doesn't always work out. So we try to avoid that where possible, but uh, for example, we've got uh, we use Basecamp, we use Trello, um, uh, Salesforce. Uh, we try to integrate everything as much as we can via API. And um, for um, our relationship and link management and content and so forth, we use um, our own link database that we've built, um, which kind of helps people uh, uh, stops them from wasting time. 
and um, allows them to alert to sort of uh, spot any um, relationships that have already been built. If so, for example, they have a, a toolbar, they're browsing um, through a website. They can already see that there's been some activity going on their website. They can click the button, and it shows them, oh, okay. Well, this guy's already spoken to him. He knows his name, his uh, email address. He knows exactly how the link was scored for this client, um, and there's the instructions for doing it the next time. So that's how we try to streamline um, streamline things. What I'd like to uh, hear if they, if anyone's happy to volunteer, um, any of the just throw some names at us, um, a type of software that you use to manage the process and um, and help yourself stay um, organized. Um, look, from, from our perspective, uh, a lot of the tools that you mentioned, Basecamp, Trello, um, are, are, are things that we, we feel are, are very, very valuable, um, not just for, um, for, for management of the team, but also management of documents, management and recording of communication and so on, very, just generally good project management tools. We have invested heavily in our, our, own, uh, our own software. Um, to, to automate where possible um, and again call on APIs to, to, to bring in information from third-party sources. In terms of time, budget and activity monitoring, we, um, we utilize a heavily customized Excel template which, uh, which we've built, uh, built ourselves. We're in the process of migrating from that to uh, to a much wider reaching project management tool which um, is, is something which is in our, our, our development roadmap for, for current year which again will integrate with all of the other tools. I think that you know integrate is, is the enormous um, kind of word uh, that, that I, I think a lot of um, a lot of people within this space tend to uh, undervalue. We, we, we have relationships um, with, say, developers which may be applicable for our social team for creating applications um, where, you know, commonality and shared resource across our different teams um, suddenly starts to um, build business value rather than specific vertical team value. Yeah. Um, James, uh, what uh, tools do you guys um, use over there? It's pretty much what we already mentioned, or anything new? Yeah, I think uh, everyone pretty much mentioned all the top level ones. But um, I mean, I think everyone has their own like custom in-house tools that people make, and you've got your own developers that customize tools to suit the team's needs. And I mean, everything's pretty much similar, I guess, across the board. I think the Steel had a really good post about uh, team management software and tools that they recommend. So. If anyone was looking for a good point to uh, start off, that was definitely a great post. Okay, you know, if anyone the, manages to find a uh, distilled uh, post, I'd appreciate a link in the chat and we'll post it in the um, in the page yeah, as well. I'll definitely have to find it. No worries. Cheers for that. Um, Kevin, um, do you have anything in particular that um, that you use uh, for, for CRM? It seems to me like uh, uh, everyone who's been like we've mentioned a couple of times, you know, scaling up, but it seems people start building their own software. <laughs> I wonder somebody who's running solo at the moment or with two, three people, they definitely don't have the time and money and resources to produce custom developed software. And it seems like all major agencies, at least the ones that we're talking to now, they're all mentioning uh, building their own. Is this the path that you went down to or are you still using um, third party software? We, uh, <laughs> we've kind of came 360 degrees. It's pretty interesting because when we, we've searched for the holy grail of a, a CRM and project management tool in one that's like a perfect fit and there just unfortunately is and there's a lot of really awesome tools on the market right now like uh, Work Etc is one that I've been checking out that it has great CRM and project management together. Um, Zoho, which is really inexpensive uh, and we used that for quite a while on the project management side. The CRM side was very complicated for our salespeople and it was kind of lacking in certain things, some of the things. We actually recently changed to Insightly, which has a great Google Apps integration. It's very simple, but it's simple good. Our salesperson is using it really easily. Everything converts and it's a CRM and project management tool. Um, talking about adding communication, you automatically click save email, it saves it to that project from within Google Apps. 
Um, so I like those things. And then from a, uh, we use so many other tools from the SEO side, as you know, but Raven Tools is great from the link manager side. We really like the link manager. We were a little pissed when they dropped the SERP tracking, but we got a yeah. local company. Got a local company here in Portland that uh, updates daily, and so we moved over to serps.com, and uh, they do all our rank tracking right now. So, are they next? <laughs> yeah, could be, could be. Yeah. So I think uh, is it a matter of keeping it low now, like yeah. uh, keeping low profile so Google doesn't catch you? <laughs> keeping it under the radar, yes. Under the radar. Okay, so James has just shared the URL. Um, for that uh, post, or oh, I guess it's Will Critchlow, Tom Critchlow. Sorry, fantastic. I'll link uh, people up. Um, one question I had was, well, actually, Kevin, uh, I had a question: is a client to employee ratio? Is there such a rule within uh, within your companies, uh, Andrew? Do you have a a, a policy there? Uh, when do you decide? Okay, we got to hire new one, new people. Um, it, the, there is no there is no specific policy on on that. Obviously, the scale and the size of the project um, very much dictates that. Um, the uh, given given the resource that's required, we we may have an analytics focus. We may have a technical or an on-site focus, um, and we we would more often than not um, resource. Uh, appropriately for what we anticipate coming up within um, within the next six to twelve months. Okay, so you sort of you, you prepare in anticipation of um, yeah, has it ever happened that it sort of goes the other way and then you've got redundancy? Um, no, it hasn't. Um, we've we've been um, we've been very uh, we've been very I, I guess uh, confident that at the point that we take people on that we can not just develop uh, the business and to take on new opportunities but also to develop those people um, who we have taken on um, to ensure that they have grown at the same speed as the business and you know one of the one of the points that um, that we kind of mentioned earlier on um, was all about kind of process and procedure and whatnot. Um, I think that you know induction and um, and development is one of the things that uh, a lot of agencies have struggled with historically, um, and ensuring that that you maximise uh, the maximise the employees who you do bring on uh, by investing in them heavily. And you know we over the last three years. Um, the people who have joined the team at the at the early stages have grown and developed with the team into some of the more senior individuals. Um, that's I, I think in, in a lot of agencies. You know, uh, I, I think that Kevin was mentioning he's he's got seven seven people who he's brought on. You know, how, how do you retain those people? And especially within a competitive market like we have in Australia. Um, you know, retention I think is is a key challenge, um, and we uh, once we have the right people in the business, we want to invest in them uh, to ensure that they uh, that they remain within the group or within the business for the long term. Very good I think, point, um, Andrew. You mentioned something there really interesting, which is kind of what I what I touched on before, which you've mentioned in in the polar opposite opposite way. Uh, I mentioned that, as I mentioned, I said we we have a lot of experience of building offshore teams, and you can get into the habit of building more than you require, right? Because you don't have the same cost structures that you would have in Australia, and that in itself brings the problem about because you you uh, you can and the guilty as charged in the past, not do the do the right training and we got to the point where as I would consider we had a very deep bench which we had a lot of potential but we didn't have as many active players on the field as I would have liked from that um, and so I've, I've, that that polar up like the both situation of a scenario but I think is um, I just wanted to point that out because it, it shows both sides of it um, and uh, it's it's the very thing that we now do a lot of is exactly that you can train you can measure what it costs you to train somebody and then lose them in a market. You can't measure what it costs 
to not train somebody and keep them? Yeah, look, um, and I think to 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 add to that, the um, the opportunity maybe within uh, when having the team in house is that there is always things or there are always things to develop, be that documentation, be it templates, be um, be it things that you you know that the team that you build are capable of doing um, and you know that there's going to be commercial value um, at some point in the future but utilizing that resource proactively um, is is something that um, you know maybe in in the quiet in the quiet month or the quiet months that that may appear within the marketing calendar um, that you have the opportunity to use that resource when it is on hand whereas if you have maybe an offshore team it might be uh, I, I would anticipate that it may be more difficult to um, to utilize that resource effectively yeah I'll, um, I'll put there something we started doing that if it hasn't been done yet uh, rec I recommend it to anyone it would completely change the way you work with your team we fly over every four to six months uh, to our team and conduct company-wide training by section depending on where it's needed uh, and align it with and we follow Rockefeller habits as, as a as a as a guidance for business growth uh, and we align the entire company whether you're offshore or not with the theme and with the priority um, for that quarter and it, it makes a good opportunity to also at the same time review what's happened um, because being face to face will completely change uh, how you do work with a team if, if you have always been offshore and never met them. Yeah, and, yeah. and look, in, a, in, an, in an environment as, um, that's evolving as quickly as ours is, um, you know, the, the point that you make about regular, regular training and regular updates, I think from a, from a, a direction perspective, um, you know, that, that is, that's required whether people are local or offshore because you, you constantly need to be um, evolving your product offering and um, maybe tweaking the, 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 the actions that you're completing on a, on a, on a weekly basis. And uh, I think what you, what you mentioned there, I'll call that out into point as well because it's critical. Um, typically the split has been that if you're working locally, it's different to working with your offshore team, but it doesn't need to be that way. Why should we treat our offshore team as anything else other than an actual extension of our team? And, and the process and training comes in under that as well. Yeah, I, I, I completely uh, I, I, I agree with you. I think that the, um, one of the challenges, I think that maybe as a larger agency um, that, we, uh, that we could face is that um, if everything is in-house, if everything um, is accountable, um, that we've actually got people who um, who are on hand to um, maybe make immediate changes rather than uh, it, it being communicated to a, a third or, a, or to another location. Yeah, uh, one one problem that uh, I'm facing is time difference, and uh, that's always been taking toll on my personal life because I have to be up at night and then I uh, sleep in I get to work in, at noon and uh, it's kind of uh, it kind of screws up with your rhythm but um, it is manageable if you have uh, if you have the right people who can take over your management process for you so um, what I've done is I've used my my background and uh, where I'm from and I've pretty much uh, uh, employed people with great English and great education in the in the uh, Croatia and Serbia. Um, they're actually our officers because I was always like same arguments that um, Andrew's putting forward. I was always scared of I could not really be comfortable just outsourcing, you know, your usual targets, Philippines, India, etc. Because I don't know those people, I can't control them. So um, same thing as uh, what Mark says. Yep, fly over there, go there, make an appearance. Um, train people, spend time. But you can't do that with 40 people. You can train two, three, four people perhaps um, and then make sure that these people have the right type of mentality to train others. So whether they're in Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne, I have the same issue uh, of distance uh, because of our three offices. 
I'm not in physical contact with our guys from uh, Melbourne or, or, or Sydney. So that's the same challenge minus the minus the time difference. Um, although it's a lot easier to fly over to Sydney and Melbourne than it is to go to Europe. Um, take, takes me 24 hours to get there. Um, I think I think it's the same same decision you have to make. Okay, I have to. I have to cut off and I have to let go and I have to transfer the responsibility over to the most senior people in the team and let them manage that part, of, that part for me, otherwise you have an enormously complex job and no life whatsoever. Um, now we've been talking about various issues and I've uh, like totally impressed with Mark's scientific approach to measuring everything. Um, I don't even know where to begin to, like if I was to implement that here. Um, uh, what I would do with that information, how I would implement that advice, and I think you know, human to human con communication is that next step. How do you moderate behavior and problems? How do you coach and guide people in the team? Um, now, we haven't got much left. That we, this is a one-hour hangout, but I, I'd, I want everyone to reflect and think about what are the key things. So, I, I guess. Uh, Wherever we are, everyone's gone through some sort of growth because SEO is a growing industry. Uh, I know Andrew's part of a, a larger group, um, so is James. Um, but you've obviously you started with small teams and you're growing them, you're developing them. So we're going through the same in different parallels, I guess. So let's try to reflect on the most important key key issues and key things. Um, Advise the uh, you know perhaps uh, solo operators who are looking to become an agency or small agencies looking to grow. How do they maintain quality? One, two, or three tips. Um, let's do around. What are your 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 key things, key takeaways from this hangout um, to maintain quality of work while growing? Um, I I actually had to think about exactly this yesterday. So um, the notes that I made were run about eight bullet points or nine bullet points. Direction and ethics associated with how you want to frame your product and where you want to take the product. Um, developing um, a strong USP, um, tying your process and policies and procedure into that and um, associating project management automation and tools with um, with. Uh, ensuring that you're able to deliver on uh, on on what you're selling into clients, um, ensuring that your product cycle is appropriate and that you're developing it in line with the, the uh, evolving marketplace, and that you, from uh, a client perspective and from a resource perspective and a team perspective, that you're proactive, um, not reactive, because the industry is changing, um, and ensuring that. Um, that, that you're that, that you're very um, transparent and clear with your clients. I find that that is uh, that that's been one of the the, the foundation stones for for us. Um, and um, you know, re reporting um, accountability uh, has has served us very well. Yeah, and accountability. I have to agree. Um, very, very important. It's important that people feel like they own projects and they own the tasks and uh, personal sense of responsibility and, and pride as well um, within the team. Um, if I'd have to single out one thing uh, as, as part of advice and something um, that I've gone through is why scale up? Is, is growing the right thing to do? Um, for example, um, at one point I was a, a very, very small um, agency and then we went through a period of growth and then we've got to that point where if a client happens to leave, we're fine. We're not like, oh, one client left, we're not able to pay wages anymore. So we've reached that stability level. And at some point we had the opportunity um, to do outbound sales, we had the opportunity to whatever people do uh, to get business, telemarketing, billboards, TV, whatever. But the question is, are we ready for it? And if your if your expenses are going like this and your and your profits are going in parallel, you basically you're you're the, you're not worse off or better off. You're just gravitating at the same uh, level, but you're main, you're adding more complexity to your business. So unless you have a way of 
creating greater profits from your business, extracting greater profits from your business, and uh, while maintain while increasing the number of accounts and clients. Yeah, unless you figure that out, um, you probably should not scale up because growth on its own just adds complexity to your life and means that you're going to do a lot more things. Uh, for example, when we hit the um, uh, million dollar wages rule, I, I wasn't aware of that. So the uh, Australian government likes to tax you for, uh, for that. Um, if I knew that, I'd probably keep us just under that level. So a lot of things add to complexity and the question is should you be growing um, and why? So unless you ha find a way to increase your margin on growth, um, you should probably uh, stay smaller and stay happy and maintain quality of work. So my, my uh, I guess the thought for the day is perhaps you should not grow unless you're ready for it. Um, I'd like to hear what uh, Kevin has to say about that. You know, it's it's something that I'm obviously thinking about all the time when I have time. But uh, for us, uh, we started the company and we said we we call it the three R's: relationship, results, and ROI. And those three things we know if we have in place with a client, we're going to re retain that client. Our retention rate is is ridiculous. We have an extremely high retention rate because we always focus our processes, our communication, everything on those three R's. Um, we, we understand that even if we are providing results for a client, if they're not perceiving those results, it, it doesn't matter. So we, we make sure that communication is extremely important. Um, I totally uh, agree with what Andrew was saying as far as retention, you know, retention of your employees. Um, it, Really, I'd say retention of clients is the most important, but really retention of employees is actually more important because those employees will be the ones that retain the clients. Um, so, and then our other big focus is people and processes. Those are really our two things. How do we improve processes, automate, um, you know, and communicate the what we're doing for the client in a, a way that they understand and that actually has been one of the biggest change for us is improving that communication um, so that they see what's going on and and not automating it but having templates because we do the same thing over and over you know here's what we do let's fix it and change it for that client and saving us time on that so those have been some of the biggest things that uh, have helped us and then our monthly happy hour keep employees happy <laughs> you know, pay, company paying for things like that, just having fun events, you know, so. Yep, great. Um, now, has anyone else got uh, the tips, the main takeaways, you know, a short burst of advice uh, for somebody who's looking or thinking about scaling up? Um, mine might seem a little bit more generalistic, but they break down into a specific um, for, for any side. And uh, because it's made a huge difference and uh, it quite uncanny a lot of a lot of what uh, Andrew has mentioned are, are the challenges that we had to the things we had to challenge our own beliefs on as well uh, and the first one would be to adopt a culture around a result you want um, what you believe in as, as, a, as a company and it's not something that's heard once but never lived something that's embraced uh, when we first rolled our values out uh, on what we believed in we openly openly encouraged everybody to question us on a value and that meant anything if we said that we were wanting to lose 10 kilos and I was eating a slice of pizza a staff member would come up to me and say do you, do you really think that's within the line of personal integrity for you and it's pretty hard to hear uh, someone questioning you on your own personal integrity if that's one of your high values and uh, when you do this for a few weeks um, it really drives it home as to what it actually means to follow it and it means it's open, an open door to be able to do it and it takes away it takes away ego it takes away the potential for someone to just say oh it's okay not to do this because such and such is um, so that was the first thing that we did that made a big a big change the second one was stand up to mistakes everyone appreciates honesty more than you might think it will save you clients the first thing if I've made a mistake is I'll say it's my bad my fault because of this this is what I've done to correct it and here's what I'll do to compensate you because of the loss. Uh, the third one was to promote questions always. Just because it's done that way, it does not mean it was done that way for the right reasons. It could have been something that somebody else implemented previously that no one actually understands why, but they just do it because that's how it's done. That goes for clients. That goes for 
for internal. You know, a lot of people have a negative view on .NET, ASP .NET MVC because of web forms. However, that's an incorrect view. MVC is for .NET is one of the most rapid frameworks for development, but the perception is still there, uh, and largely because of past experiences. And uh, the fourth, the fourth major one was to challenge beliefs always, and I'll give an example so that that, that makes sense. I noticed that uh, I've worked with many countries, India, Philippines, Russia, and we're, in, we're positioned in two major countries, one for enterprise development and one for operational output and uh, what we do as a, as a media company. And I started to notice that I, I was thinking, well, maybe I need to, you know, can I get what I want there? Um, can I get the high level that I'm looking for, the 3% the that makes the difference? There's the 80-20 rule for productivity, but it's actually the 3% that makes you the subject matter expert, um, or the 5% or whatever percent it happens to be. And so I set out to challenge that, and, I, and I, I questioned a lot of the top people in that particular country that had nothing to do with the digital space, and I came across one particular person who was happy to have a conversation with me. He was the entire VP of marketing for a top 60 internet retailer in the US that turned over $300 million a year. And he managed a team of over 130 people in this offshore country, uh, in this, in this uh, you call it a third world country, if you will. And he was directly responsible for the profit and loss and bottom line of all activities to do with marketing for that company. And everything was driven out of that country. The strategy was driven 60 or 70 percent by the CMO in in the US and the and in combination with him. And that conversation really made me challenge to say, well, is it just my current belief uh, of that? Am I not looking right? Or am I not doing enough to find the person I need there? Since that, uh, I've also then adopted an even higher standard because if you expect that you can go and pay peanuts and get skill, then you know, of course, you're not going to get the right people you need. Um, so, you know, that that is uh, that's my latest revelation, if you will, in challenging a particular belief. Very good. Um... David, if you were to, um, you know, think about growth, what would be one uh, one thing you would add to the to the advice so far given? Um, my big thing is why are you growing? So um, one statement made by a very large agency recently was, "Well, I want to get to a million dollars." You know, they want a million dollars worth of revenue. They don't care. That's what their sort of, I guess, their targets are. So, you know, are you growing for personal reasons, such as, you know, I used to run my own agency, but I never wanted to hire people. You know, someone like Dan wanted to build up and, you know, not work for someone else. So, you know, why are you making a decision of growth? Is it for personal reasons? Is hit KPIs and bonuses, or is a business told you you need to grow it? Um, so, I think that's the biggest thing as to why are you growing for the sake of growing? Are you growing for vanity or ego? You know, that's the biggest question you need to be able to answer. Yeah, good point. That's so, sort of somewhat related to what I had to say. Is like uh, you need to really decide: Are you growing just to grow, or are you growing to make more profit, or are you growing for stability? Um, understand what is the agenda behind it. I, th I think that's uh, that's a very valid point. Um, but also about, the profits. Yep. Yeah, you know that's <laughs> that's that's a big thing. Sort of what Kevin said that you know you have to look at your margins. So if you're adding an extra ten staff and your margins drop by half, you know is that is that a smart move? <laughs> that's not growing, that's shrinking. <laughs> um, inflating or whatever you want to call it. Um, I think I think a lot of good advice has been given. Um, this was an open open structured discussion um, uh, and I hope people who, watch, who are watching this live, uh, I can see that we've got some viewers um, and people who will be watching this recording. Um, drop us a line, feel free to uh, uh, drop line in the comments on the Hangout page and we'll try to answer any of your follow-up questions to the Hangout. I'd like to close by a fun question um, for our latest uh, person to join, Jim Munro. Um, if you were to um, start up an agency, um, maybe tell us a little bit about your setup and if you start up an agency, um, how would you go about uh, growth? What would be your top ninja advice? Look, most of our clients come from recommendations from friends. Um, um, so we're not in a hurry to grow. Um, we're we're, um, we're, we're um, just just looking to to uh, uh, have a business where we provide 
a service and make a living from it. Uh, and our clients are happy and we're happy. Um, we're not, not seeking to be the biggest and the best, just just, just, just the best. And um, look, I, I do have uh, something I can give you. I can, I can give you something that, uh, if I can just find it quickly, on our internet, we've had this here since uh, 1997, uh, and it's worked for us. Uh, and it's a quote from a guy called John Woods, uh, the founder of CWL Publishing, and he wrote, the purpose of a business is to create a mutually beneficial relationship between itself and those it serves. Uh, when it does that well, it will be around tomorrow to do it some more. And I thought that was great. We put it on our internet and uh, followed it, and uh, it's worked so far. That's that's perfect. It's a really um really good way to uh, to wrap up this hangout. Um, thanks a lot, Jim, and uh, thanks everyone um, in the hangout panel. Um, Andrew, David, uh, Kevin, Mark, uh, thanks a lot for tuning in. And for everyone who else who um, is watching, um, next week we're going to pick another topic. If you want to vote for what should be the next discussion, um, let us know in the comments. Um, otherwise, uh, I wish you a good day and good evening for everyone in Australia. See you guys. Bye-bye.